There are a lot of powers in video games that we all wish we had in real life. Indestructible hands, double jump, a complete lack of social anxiety. Are you guys sailors? But for my money, the best power would be the ability to save and reload. Think about it. Saving is a power in just about every video game, so we don't really think about it all that much. But developers think about it a lot. Save systems aren't arbitrary, they're a part of the game's design. And the way a game saves can affect everything from the game's difficulty, to its narrative, to even the gameplay itself. And you are truly, truly sure about this? To understand this better, it helps to look at how game saving became a game save thing. Back in the age of arcades, the hardware required to save a game was costly and complicated and gigantic. But it's not like developers wanted to add the feature anyway. Arcade games were a quarter-based hustle designed to be inconvenient. Hey, that's a nice run you got going there. Be a shame if you ran out of quarters. But with the advent of personal computers and home consoles, all of that would change. Now, saving a game needed to be convenient above all. The first console game that allowed players to save their game was The Legend of Zelda, which actually had to include a battery inside the cartridge to power the solid-state memory chip. The 90s were an explosion of game-saving innovations, which soon made the feature standard. This left developers with an important decision to make. Just how many save points should their game have? Too few, and it might make the game too difficult. But give the player too much freedom to save, and, well, it's a heck of a lot harder to program. Now, the creators on the original Resident Evil tackled this problem with a creative solution. They embedded the game's save system into the narrative, using typewriters as save points. This not only helpfully restricted for them where and when a player was going to save their game, but it also made the act of saving into a limited resource by requiring an ink cartridge for every save. Dead Rising's infamous toilet-based save system was similarly cruel. Not because it made you save in restrooms, that part was actually pretty funny and frankly narratively appropriate given the situation. No, it was cruel because upon death, players were forced to choose whether they wanted to keep their skills and XP, or their progress in the story, but never both. Unsurprisingly, that system was flushed out by the third game. For horror games, you can understand how these types of save systems ratchet up the tension and make survival even more high stakes. But also, fuck that. Luckily, not many games have save systems that punishing anymore. Generous autosaving is practically the norm these days, and quick saving is even becoming more common. But a save system that lets you save anytime, anywhere, isn't just more convenient. It also opens up a lot of possibilities. Literally. In the tactical stealth game Desperados 3, it's possible to get by these guards using a distraction. But it's also possible to throw a knife from these bushes. And it's just as possible to blast them with a revolver. Figuring out which is the best possible option requires a little trial and error, which is why the game really wants you to just save and reload all the time. It tells you as much in the tutorial, it reminds you while you're playing, and then it shows you how many times you did it at the end of a mission. The thing we really want to encourage, like save as many times as you want. Like it's not required that you do like three actions like perfectly in a row or something. This is Dominic Abbe, the creative director for Desperados 3, talking about that power I wish I had in real life. Saves coming. Um, I think it has like a bad connotation, <laughs> I guess. I see it differently, but I think it's very depending on the game and the, and the genre. Save scumming is the repeated act of saving and reloading a game in order to avoid any consequences. Some frown upon this because it can be used as an exploit, especially in games that involve a lot of random outcomes. But Desperados 3 was designed to be predictable. It wants players to have all the information they need, so they can experiment with different strategies. In that way, it's not just a stealth game, it's also a puzzle game, where you need to find out the right solution. And if something doesn't work, you just hit F8, and seconds later, you're right back at the save point you chose. Optimizing my micro loop around a little puzzle and experimenting with it, that I think was like always, for me personally, a core fun of those games. Those games he's talking about are his studio's previous title, Shadow Tactics, and the game both that and Desperados trace their lineage from, Commandos. They're part of an entire mini-genre built around the idea that save scumming isn't an exploit, it's a feature. But not all games are built this way. Way back when The Elder Scrolls II was released, the game's manual implored players not to abuse the game's save system. 
or else they might risk missing out on the entertainment of rolling with their mistakes. And hey, I can get behind that. Rolling with your goofs can lead to some really rewarding moments. It's basically the highlight of any good tabletop campaign. That's a good one. <laughs> but save scumming can also let you experience game storylines you might otherwise miss. If I hadn't save scummed a series of assassination and marriage proposals in Crusader Kings 3, I would never have been able to take over all of Europe and make war with the Pope. Just like Elder Scrolls, this is a game about role-playing, a game where you craft a story of your wins and your losses. But maybe I just wanted 100% wins. You're not the boss of me. Also, I'm the Pope now. Safe Scumming gets a bad rap because it's a way for players to avoid the full life consequences of their decisions. It's why there are long-running series of games built around the idea that it's quote-unquote fun to roll with our failures. XCOM is one of those games, and its famous consequence is permadeath. If you lose a soldier in the heat of battle, they're gone for good, along with all the experience you poured into them. And let me tell you, it's a heck of a lot rougher when you've named all your soldiers after cats you know in real life. Rest in peace, Bobo. So what's the payoff for all of this suffering? Well, that's where a lot of the fun of XCOM comes from, being able to adapt and the game's throwing these wrenches in your plans. And then that's when you really feel like a tactical genius is when the game seems like it's doing everything it can to make you lose, but you still come out the other side victorious. Mark Nauda helped design the last two XCOM games, so he knows from experience that getting players to roll with the punches is easier said than done. This is where Iron Man mode comes in. Iron Man mode is basically there is no manual saving in the campaign at all in XCOM. We just maintain an autosave of your last actions you did up to the up to the moment. So everything that I've done wrong, I have to live with forever, 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 forever. Big mood. Obviously, this makes the game a lot harder, but players still have to opt in to that mode. So for the non-Ironmans out there, Nauda and company have come up with some other ways to gently nudge players away from safe scumming, not that it's gonna stop me. One of those involves random seeds. Remember those shots that have a percent chance of succeeding but never seem to go your way? By using a random seed to generate the success or failure in these situations, the result can be random, but also fixed. So if you would just kind of like pure save scum, which was like save right before I shoot, and then load and keep retrying the shot, the results wouldn't change because the seed, like if you didn't change anything tactically, the result would always be the same. Look, explaining how random seeds and pseudo random number generators work is a little bit beyond my smarts, but basically the result of your shot will be randomly calculated according to the probability shown the first time. And every time after that, it'll roll the exact same result. For players to get a different random result, they need to change something up flank right instead of left, or use a different ability. They can still technically save scum, just try not to be so boring about it. Yeah, I think there, there is an aspect of like, if they want to do it, they can. Because I think everyone has that line of unacceptable consequences. I definitely have one. Counter to XCOM's brutal reputation, the series is actually designed to make the sting of loss a little less biting, so people won't be so quick to just reload. For example, the fatigue stat introduced in XCOM 2 prevented players from taking the exact same squad on missions over and over again. So when things did eventually go pear-shaped, the player still had some veterans in waiting instead of fielding a bunch of scrubs fresh out of scrub school. We don't want players feeling like they need to go back and redo stuff. I think the key is in providing things like, that feel like opportunities even when bad things happen to make sure that it's not just um, always zoom and gloom when things roll bad. Their solution wasn't Mario Kart style rubber banding, as fun as it would be to chuck a blue shell at a chrysalid. Instead, the game provided an emergency mission, which is kind of like a double or nothing gamut where you put all your chips on the table. And there are these big scary missions, but if you win, you know, you kind of get a reset on a lot of the stuff on the map. Like it has a really good positive effect. So we give you a chance to like kind of catch up through these you know, things that look like we're being really mean, but you know, I like to think we're being really nice to the player there. The glorious feeling of defeating one of these missions is something you'd never get if you always save scummed. But how much save scumming you do in XCOM is ultimately your choice. Iron Man can take away the temptation, but the developers don't want to force everyone to play that way. It's the same reason Resident Evil 2 Remake brought back inkwell cartridges, but only in an optional hardcore mode. 
no matter how creative developers get, convenience is still the number one priority of any save system. And that convenience can also be for the developer who has to make the dang thing. Most save systems are kind of like a checklist of what the player has accomplished. Keeping track of quest lines and items and stats is a little more difficult than simply recording which chapter the player last completed. Autosaving is especially handy, because the developer controls exactly what state the game is in whenever it saves. A quick save system, on the other hand, has to capture all that stuff, plus your location, plus the enemy's location, plus the location of any objects you might have moved. And games with large, destructible environments like Teardown? Hoo boy. They have to use some wild compression algorithms to package their worlds into easily digestible save files. Not only that, but since Teardown's game loop is built around trial and error experimentation, the developer went to great lengths to make sure all that magic math didn't keep the quick save from actually being quick. Save systems are the reason that we can enjoy playing video games at our leisure, dipping in and out whenever we feel like it. And while it's for the best that we can't save scum in real life, it's a fact of life in video games. So it's nice to see that developers are really thinking about how to incorporate it into their design, or everything that I've done wrong I have to live with forever. Gently pushing us to live with everything we've ever done wrong. Forever. Thank you.